this drug costs a thousand, you dispensed it, we paid you nine hundred, so you already took the hundred dollar hit, but then we still think we paid you too much. Actually, it should have been seven hundred, so let me take two hundred dollars more out. So you dispensed it at a loss, and they're going to take two hundred dollars more because you still think you paid too much. In what world does that make any sense? Yeah, can you imagine if you go buy a car from Tesla <laughs> and then they lowered their prices and you're like, hey, I want to go back, you know, I'm not really happy. Can I claw back my money? No, Tesla would just say, go fuck yourself. And you can buy a new model that's coming out next year. Yeah. That would never happen. We were li we live? I think we're live now. Yeah. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Orange Pill Club. How are you doing today? How's Friday? I'm doing pretty good. It's finally Friday. I've, I feel like so much has gone on on the news with, you know, relationship to pharmacy, with relation, with relationships to the Web3 industry. So we have like really two major topics that I think we both find interesting that we want to talk about. The first one is really Pharmageddon. So Farmageddon is like actually a hashtag that's been trending all over Twitter, all over LinkedIn. And it's essentially a lot of retail pharmacists who are just really upset with the working conditions that they have to put through working at a retail pharmacy like CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid. So this Farmageddon event actually occurred from November 30th to, I believe, November 2nd. So it's done today. October. There isn't any farm. Oh, it's, it's October in October? 30th. October 30th. 30th. I'm sorry. So yeah, it was October 30th. 30th, October 31st, November 1st. So I think it was three days. Right. So it's finally over. But I, I think it's really important to understand, like, why are we having Farmageddon? Like, what does this mean? So, why the, this yeah, this, yeah, this initial one is, uh, it's kind of focusing on Walgreens, but all three major pharmacy retail chains have had um, scheduled walkouts over the course of the last, I want to say, month, right? It all It all started off and kicked off with Kaiser's walkout. And then CVS had theirs, Rite Aid had theirs, um, and then Walgreens was scheduled this week along with um, more CVS stores too. So, yeah, there's so many challenges in the drugstore industry. I mean, from personal experience, you being the pharmacist, you sometimes don't have enough staff that are there. And when you leave your shift at a retail store, the next person who takes over your shift doesn't really care about the patient. Sometimes they're no, what's they're known as what we call floaters in this industry. Mm -hmm. Floaters are there just to get their hours and do the bare minimum amount of work. So there's always this, been this inconsistent sort of care when it comes to patients and pharmacy. Yeah, well, it's, it's inconsistencies in care, and it's also just being overworked. It's it's the sheer number. Like think about any other business, you know, where it's. It's very methodical. Like you have, you start your process, maybe somebody calls the office, secretary picks up, they give, you know, take down the message, give it to whoever's higher up. They take care of it. If it's a sale, they'll negotiate or do whatever with the buyer, figure it out. It's like, it's step by step, right? It's not like you have 15 customers at once, all wanting 15 different things, all wanting it within 15 seconds. Like it's not like that in any other business. But in retail pharmacy, that's exactly what it is. You have a line literally out the door or around the corner. You have angry people because they just want their medications and they want to get out. You have four people behind the counter trying to do 15 different things at once, all while having a pile up of two, 300 prescriptions that they still need to fill for the other people that are going to come pick it up for the rest of the day. So you constantly have this battle where you're like, all right, let me verify as a pharmacist. I'll be like, okay, let me verify this prescription. Oh, somebody came in. Both the technicians are busy. Let me go help the customer in the front. Oh, that customer in the front has a concern. I go back to the back. Now there's a phone call. I pick up the phone call while I'm still trying to verify the prescription that I was verifying in the first place. And then another customer comes in, they have to get an immunization. So you have to go and prep all that. It's not like the needle's just ready and you just go and jab the patient. You're good. You got to prep the injection, pull it out of the vial, clean whatever you got to clean, set up the station swab the patient, get them do a little counseling, then you jab them, then you got to wait 15 minutes. Well, that's what, 20, 25 minutes that have gone by? All while those 15 patients are still standing in line, they still need their prescriptions verified, and everyone still needs what they need within a certain amount of time. Like there's just no way any human being can get all that done within that time frame for nine hours a day. Like it's insane. How, how, how long does it take for a pharmacist to verify a prescription? I mean, I, I think we should give some context there. Like how important is that? 
dispensing like dispensing verification verifying and dispensing medications like how important is that how time consuming is that for the individual pharmacist well let's let's back out even further than that and look at the entire workflow for one single prescription a prescription will come in either a hard copy meaning a patient brings it in either a fax meaning it comes in the fax machine or now what's most common and usually required is electronic prescriptions so you have an electronic prescription that gets pulled up on the computer right a pharmacy technician will see that prescription, they'll process it. They have to verify everything on the prescription and then do data entry, which takes, I wanna say anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute. Let's just say, you know, let's say a minute to be more lenient. Then that gets done, the label comes out, it goes into fulfillment. At least this is how we do it. It goes into fulfillment. The fulfillment happens, so another pharmacy technician will then fill that prescription, which they have to, you know, prep everything, pull the bottle from the shelf, count how many medications it is. If you have an automated counting machine, that time goes down. Most pharmacies don't have an automated machine, so they're counting 30, 60, 90, sometimes 540 tablets by hand. So that can take anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes. Then after that's all done, the prescription goes into verification for the pharmacist. The pharmacist has to pull the prescription up on the computer screen, verify it's all typed correctly, verify the medication in the bottle is actually accurate, check to see if there's any interactions with the previous medications, check to see if there's anything else that needs to be counseled with the patient, if it's a brand new medication, if it's a refill, whatever additional things that we have to do. Then it gets verified, which the pharmacist checked everything, everything looks good, then it gets to the patient. That entire process, I would say, if you're very efficient, at least for me, I know we can get it done in about 90 seconds for a single script, but for a chain environment, maybe it's two minutes or three minutes. Now think about that two or three minutes times four to 500 prescriptions a day. Right. That you, you can't fit it all in nine hours or eight hours while having all your staff being able to take their 15 minute breaks, their 30 minute lunch and to have some time to just breathe and to get reorganized. Right. Like it's just yeah. all of it doesn't fit. Yeah, it's really difficult. You know, one thing I've noticed working in retail is that there isn't really a segregated distinction between who needs to do what kind of work. Typically in an assembly line business, you have people focused on one set of problems, say, it's data entry with resolute with resolving you know claims with insurance and then you have a set of pharmacists who are just focused there on the clinical approval part does this drug make sense for the customer or if they take it could they pers you know could potentially harm be done here and you know it seems like working at cvs working at walgreens it, that's not how they operate i see pharmacists who have to do data entry clerical stuff, meaning registering the customer out at the point of sale, them having to deal with provider phone calls for clinical issues. They have to do trouble. They have to troubleshoot insurance um, claims as well. And I'm just like, this is not realistic. It's it just seems like a complete inefficient use of time, but I'm not saying, you know, pharmacists are inefficient. It's just that obviously you need to have more employees that are specialized in doing what they do in the pharmacy. And I, I don't think any retail store has sort of realized that that's how the model needs to be. Mm, it depends. I, I don't know. Maybe in like a chain setting, it might be different because they have different metrics and different things that they need to meet. I know at least I can speak personally with my practice. We've kind of narrowed down all those efficiencies and streamlined the workflow. So we have dedicated roles for each you know staff member, but at the end of the day, it's, still a lot that you got to do you, that entire process that I outlined. That's if everything is fine. Like patient's insurance is on file. The copays are good to go. We have the medication in stock. There's no other issues, you know, that need to be there. That's just the, the simplest form. But if you have all those issues that you outlined where eligibility checks, patient doesn't have insurance or they do have insurance, but it's not pulling up. You have to call the insurance to get a coverage check or it's something more specialized, which needs a prior authorization, which requires coordination of care between provider, between pharmacy, and then ultimately the patient. Like those are all additional things that need to be done on top of just the standard dispensing, right? Now imagine doing four or 500 of those type of scenarios a day with three people employed in the entire store. It just, it doesn't work. Like we, one side we're talking about, you know, there has to be specialized roles for each person. But if each person is wearing every single hat every five or 10 minutes, there's no specialization left. There's no segregation of tasks. It's just everyone's doing everything. And that, if you ask me like just off the street, like, hey, this is a work environment. What do you think? Well, can you sum it up in one word? I'd be like chaos. 
chaos is the best way to explain it. If you walk into a CVS at like 4 p.m., it will literally be chaos. You will get a headache just watching everybody behind the counter running around. Like it's that crazy. You know, and a lot of people don't, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that because they're just there to get their medications and they're like, why is this taking so long? Yeah, I I think for a lot of people, they just don't understand how pharmacy operates, how it's run and all the challenges that go behind it. And what's sort of sad is the way pharmacy has developed, it's always traditionally been in the back of the farm or back in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have this expectation of going to the grocery store, inspecting the cashier to check me out super, super fast. They're scanning items left and right. Pharmacy is not really like a grocery store, but because you're in that environment, you have almost the same expectation to say, hey, look, I know it's going to be really quick. It's well, let me, but... let, me, let me draw a parallel to the grocery store. Let's say right now I go to the grocery store and I want to buy you know, milk, I want to buy some eggs, I want to buy some cheese, I want to buy some chicken, and I want to buy you know, a chocolate bar or a tub of ice cream. Five things, right? I just go and grab that off the shelf and then take it to the register. There isn't somebody making the ice cream and grabbing the chicken from the back and then packaging it. There isn't somebody else boxing the cereal and verifying that it's actually Frosted Flakes in there and not Captain Crunch. Nobody's doing that. Everything's already prepackaged and ready to go. And it's, it's efficient because it's a retail setting, right? People want that retail setting experience with a retail pharmacy, but they don't understand that there's things going on behind the counter to make sure that you're getting the right thing. If you accidentally eat Captain Crunch instead of Frosted Flakes, nothing's going to happen. But if you accidentally take a medication for your cholesterol when you have no cholesterol issues or something worse like an antifungal or antiviral when you don't have any illness like that, that can be a really big issue. And people don't understand that, that it's not just simple. You know, you don't go to the doctor's office and be like, the doctor just looks at you and be like, all right, yeah, you have a cold and you have high blood pressure. No, they got to do a bunch of other things, a bunch of tests, a bunch of labs, figure out what's going on, right? That all takes time. People have that expectation on the medical side. How come that isn't translated on the pharmacy side? Because the pharmacy side is just as important. If you get the wrong medication, it could be fatal in certain cases, right? So why is that not drawn as a parallel between the entire healthcare market industry, you know, whatever you want to call it? So let's just try to like, let's just pretend we're Walgreens or CVS, right? For the sake of this conversation, how do you solve this issue? You hire more employees. It's yeah. So it's, it goes past just hiring more employees. Cause you can have a thousand people in a location that don't know what they're doing. If there's no training, it's just a thousand people. It's just taking up space, right? There has to be enough staff. There has to be enough staff that's properly trained. And then there has to be some sort of designation of who's doing what, which are our titles and our licenses specify that pharmacist pharmacy technician, pharmacy clerk, they have predetermined roles, but in most of these settings, everybody's doing everything. Obviously a technician or clerk isn't verifying the pharmacy, verifying prescriptions and counseling patients, but that burden falls on top of, onto the pharmacist in addition to everything a technician and a clerk would do too, right? And I mean, I don't know, like for me, I've worn every hat I've gone and made deliveries too. I still go out and make deliveries. So I'm pharmacy clerk, pharmacy technician, pharmacist owner and pharmacy driver, and then maintenance and cleanup too. Like that's seven things on a daily basis that, you know, I have to do. So more staff would be great, but they, then you get into, you know, let's look at the flip side. Like if, if you're CVS or Walgreens and you have to hire, you know, a hundred thousand more people across all locations, that's a steep expense, correct? It, it, people don't work for free. No one works for free. Like you have to pay staff and employees because they're employed. That's the whole point of it. So you want all this extra help, but then the pharmacy maybe isn't making enough money to be able to afford the help. Well, then you're in a deadlock. What do you do? Like, what's the the, the solution? You cut pay for the people that are there so you can have more bodies there, but then nobody's going to be, you know, inclined to work. So it, it uh, from my standpoint, just looking at this, it's, it's kind of a deadlock, no win situation right now. And I don't know whether, you know, because a lot of these stores are closing too. And I think the main goal for these big chains is to consolidate where their locations are to kind of get more staff concentrated in certain areas. But then you're creating a hole for 
you know, smaller towns and things like that, which we brought up on previous episodes. And you're creating yeah. a hole for a lot of these patients and they, they have to drive 40, 50 miles to go get the prescription. But you have to find the balance. Like, is that 40 mile drive worth it to make sure that you get the right medication and the right care and the counseling and everything? Or do you want to go around the corner and potentially get the wrong medication or not get your medication at all and then have your health worsen? I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for independent pharmacies, you know, small businesses to sort of fill that gap, which when I look at, you know, CVS, Walgreens closing down, those are my media thoughts. But I think the issue here of, you know, why are we having Pharmageddon? It stems much deeper and the solution is actually much more convoluted than we actually tend to believe. What I see is that pharmacy is such a vertically integrated industry with other industries. So to give an example, Caremark, they're a pharmacy benefit manager. They handle the flow of funds for all these different health plans and they own the pharmacy as well. Well, a lot of the value of these prescription claims, they're being extracted at the PBM level and the remaining funds that are passed down to the provider at the pharmacy level, it's de minimis, it's not that much. What ends up happening is if the pharmacy model if that revenue is tanked just enough to survive, but to, you know, still do a function of daily business, pharmacies are sort of obligated and constrained by their financials to run their pharmacy the way it can only run in a very poor manner. Right. So the way I've looked at this quite for some time is, well, you know, if there's a prescription claim and there's a hundred dollars here, 70% of it's probably taken by the PBM. And then 30% is passed to the pharmacy and the drug cost is probably like 18% of it. <laughs> so okay. that remaining 2%, you know, goes to the pharmacy provider. And you sort of look at that and say, well, how does a business survive on that kind of number? If it's, you know, 2%, that's pretty low. I mean, most, in, most industries with some sort of inventory, they make margins of anywhere from 50 to a hundred percent, but in a pharmacy, those margins are much smaller. And it's because a lot of these PBMs extract so much value from the pharmacy level. So I think, you know, the PBMs kind of knew what they were doing here. And it's unfortunate that this is the way the lay of the land is. And, mo and PBMs are, in general aren't regulated on this aspect of drug pricing. They, they get to determine their formulary. They get to determine what the reimbursement is, which is what, you know, the, the PBM or the payer ultimately pays to the pharmacy. It's all determined by the PBM. So they're going to extract the maximal value that they can, right? Because at the end of the day, a PBM is a business too. And their job and their role is to extract maximum value for their company, just like any other businesses. So I, I get their perspective. It's just how far do we let that go before it's too much? And there's been a couple of states that have, you know, passed bills or attempting to pass bills to outlaw all PBMs and go back to the traditional, I don't know if you remember the traditional pharmacy model. There was no PBMs. There was none of that. It was just direct contracted rates. It was whack, you know, plus a percentage, not we're, we're, this is how much the, the cost is. We're going to take minus 28% or whatever the rates are now. You know, like the, the model has kind of shifted from positive all the way to the other side of being negative um, in terms of what the pharmacy gets for dispensing. And like you said, it's vertically integrated and most pharmacies don't determine, or all, all pharmacies don't determine their own prices. It's all predetermined and preset. So you can't increase your prices to be able to increase your staff and to be able to pay more people to be able to work, to make it more efficient because the starting point isn't adjustable. So what do you do? A lot of pharmacies, you know, they, they use the, they say, okay, well, we can't adjust the prices. So we're just going to get busier and do more volume. Well, guess what? When you have more volume and more scripts you're filling, you need more staff to be able to fulfill all that to then be able to make more money. So it just keeps going into that constant loop of, of a balancing act. And yeah, the, if the PBMs, you know, get are kind of checked, it could help. I mean, that's the ultimate solution, but do you think that's realistic? I think there needs to be model. a different technology in place. I mean, the way I look at this, I mean, kind of relating even back to me, Howdy is like, how do you remove the middleman in this business model? 
Right. I believe we we could probably create an entirely new transaction network where it's only between the pharmacy and the health plan, completely omitting the PBM. And there's probably a way to do it where there's a check and balance in terms of the pricing that's being invoiced to the health plan. I'm sure that could be all built as an open software code. And I think that would save, you know, tremendous value in this industry. But again, I, it's an idea I think we have to probably flush out a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, like, I don't know if you remember, but like when you're, when you're processing a claim, there's always two columns. There's like the build amount and then what's, you know, actually paid out. Yep. So you'll look at like the build amount for a medication that costs maybe a hundred bucks. The amount billed to the insurance will be like $700. It's not a hundred dollars, but then you looked at your paid column and you're getting paid $108. So you made an $8 profit off a hundred dollar drug with all of your expenses. That's just gross profit. You know, you have to subtract all the expenses, all the labor, all the time, all that stuff off of a $8 margin, but the insurance company is being billed $700. So that gap of the $600, where's that going to and who benefits? It's the PBM, right? Yeah. So that, that gap that got so wide for the PBMs end, I think that needs to come back down to a reasonable level. Spread pricing. That's what yeah. it's called. It's, it's a huge problem. I, th I think in this industry and even raising awareness about spread pricing, PBM tactics, what I've typically found in healthcare, these are not sexy topics to talk about. A lot of people just, it goes over their head. I don't want to learn this. Yeah, this this is such a, this is such a complicated, you know, issue. I don't know how you, how how someone raises awareness, and I think Farmageddon is like yeah one step there, but it's really hard to get the entire pharmacy pharmacist industry to say hey look, I mean we need to be paid more for our rates, we need to be paid at a higher rate, and if drug pricing goes up three percent every year, our checks should also go up three percent every year, but that's never what happens. <laughs> no, it doesn't, and you have to also look at it from you know a business standpoint, like. Walgreens and CVS, they, they don't have this ill intention of being like, yeah, we're not going to pay any of our staff, any of our pharmacists. We want everyone to work for free and then just work 12 hours and be overworked. Like that's not their goal, obviously. But when we highlight these things where the margins are so thin, well, for a big entity like CVS or Walgreens, that's amplified where their margins are, their, their cost is that much higher, their revenue is that much higher, but that margin stays fairly the same. Like, yeah, they, they get their medications and their drugs at much lower cost than, let's say, an independent would because the contracts are better. But it's also on a grander volume, right, in a grander scale. So in the scheme of all of it, they're kind of playing the same game that a small independent pharmacy would be playing, where they're trying to figure out how much they're making and how much they can afford and back and forth. Like, it's the same thing. I'm not here to, you know, completely bag on Walgreens and CVS and their entire C-suite and all that, but... They're going through the same motions and issues that any other business owner would go if they can't afford their staff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you saw Rite Aid file bankruptcy over this opiate um, right. issue. I mean, they were found liable for a lot of different damages and they had to file chapter 11 to restructure the entity. And it just seems like a lot of other companies like Walgreens, they acquired Village MD as an urgent care provider, but it seems like their acquisition of that, which was roughly 9 billion, didn't really pan out. So I think a lot of companies have made some pretty unpopular bets. They've made some mistakes and they're just saddled with so much debt at this point right now. So what do you do as a company to make sure you continue to survive? You have to consolidate, right? It's yeah. the only option. I mean, that the, the entire opioid, you know, epidemic, lawsuits that all three of the big chains faced they it was in what in the was it in the tens of millions hundreds of millions it was a big number it was huge yeah i don't remember what the exact number was but you know that it's that debt on top of everything else and over the last i want to say five to ten years all the chain pharmacies they expanded like crazy and now they're kind of paying the price for all that you know covid was like a big honeymoon phase for for a lot of these pharmacies, because they were giving it vaccinations and, you know, they had constant people coming in and out and there was just more business. But now that all of that's kind of dissipated, they're, they're struggling, right? Yeah. So this article here, um, you know, talks about the Farmageddon and then Shane Jero Minsky, 
Former Walgreens farm assistant, one of the organizers of the wall to walk out, told readers that as many as 5,000 pharmacy workers would walk out across the three, three days. But that said exact number of expected stores and staff was not clear due to the lack of a union. I think pharmacies is the only non-unionized. Yeah, that that's so strange to me. Like, it's so strange that there's no union for pharmacists. <laughs> strange. So strange. Yeah. I mean, pharmacies are the low-hanging fruit, right? Pharmacists and the entire pharmacy market and profession. But yeah, the, the, the main concern yeah, is being understaffed, which, you know, if you have additional staff, it solves a good chunk of these issues. But staff costs money. It, it comes down to how the dollar is being moved at the end of the day and who's getting a piece of it. You know, if you have a hundred hands trying to get a single dollar, well, everyone's going to get a penny if that. So yeah, this other article I saw, was just kind of an overview of what led us to this point. Um, I mean, you remember a lot of chain pharmacists and pharmacies have been complaining about working environments for, for years now, you know, it's just, it's starting to become a little bit more exposed and prevalent because more and more people are participating instead of just keeping their head down because most pharmacies five or 10 years ago, they would have been like, yeah, we're kind of overworked, but you know, it's work and we got to make sure we take care of our patients. And now it's like, well, we don't even have the bandwidth to do anything, let alone all these tasks that we already have to do. So it's come to a breaking point, I think. And this is just, in my opinion, the beginning. I want to read this article out loud. This is pretty interesting. One by one, the pharmacist dialed into a weekly conference call with their boss. He could have empathized with them or addressed the reality of their pressure cooker environment. One that breeds medication errors and creates missed opportunities to prevent potentially deadly mistakes. Instead, CVS district leader Khalil Hadir Hadar turned up the heat. He harped on his Texas and Louisiana based team to hit corporate quotas, sell more store memberships. Oh, man. <laughs> Push for more prescription pickups. Vaccinate more people. He threatened discipline and staff cuts unless pharmacists convince at least five customers that week to get a flu shot before flu season had even officially started. This guy sounds like a slave driver. If you get your goal, nobody will come after you, Hadir said on the call. One of the several recorded and shared with US Today and many patients... They are ignorant. They don't know what the flu is. How are you going to convince them? How can you persuade them? That's your job as a pharmacist. First of all, That's I don't terrible. know if calls are legally allowed to be recorded in these states. I know in California, you're not actually allowed to record a call without someone's consent. But regardless, this is something that's already been published on the news. And it's this district leader. Sounds like he's talking to pharmacists at the stores he like that work for him. Um, to hit their metrics. That's kind of crazy, man. Well, you remember it, there used to be, and I know all the chains took it out, but there used to be a metric that they had to have a certain, there, there was a quota, like you had to give X amount of injections in the flu season, you had to fill X amount of prescriptions within a day, a week, a month, a year. Like they had all these metrics and quotas for all the chains. They have taken that out as far as the public knows and we know. Um I don't know if there's still some back end metrics that they do have to follow. Oh, they, sure dude, is. those metrics never went away. Yeah. They just they can't just use it as justification for things. That's all. Right. You think so, a store is not going to know they did 200 a day? Like, people, that's like, that's a number. I check my number there. every day, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, part no, of it. Seriously. No, but there used to be like, there would be a board because I had a, a CVS DM district manager that once like showed me. He's like, yeah, we have, we have this board on the wall. So it's like, if we don't meet the quota, and it was literally a, a bar graph and they would just add to the bar graph till they hit their quota for the month. I was like, this is, this is crazy to have it just publicly, you know? And then if you don't meet that quota, well then everyone pays the price according to, to this article in this. What's that price? Audio. A pizza party? <laughs> what is oh, yeah. that price? No, 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 no. That's, party. that's for a job well done is a pizza party, oh, you know, 12 slices of pizza for 24 people. Um, but yeah, so the, the store, staffing store, is, I think the biggest, the yeah, biggest so this one says stores that a decade ago might have had two pharmacists and six pharmacy technicians 
filling an average of 500 prescriptions a day now. That may be half the staff and an even higher prescription volume, plus an endless crush of vaccine appointments, rapid tests, and patient consultation calls. Yeah, I think a pharmacist can realistically by themselves do about 200 um, in a day. You can definitely bump that number up if you have a few technicians. But yeah, I mean, 2-6, or a 2-6 ratio. Oh, so they actually, yeah, that's pretty interesting. They have a 2-6 ratio here at 500. That's pretty sizable, actually. That's a pretty good amount. Yeah, that that's comfortable. Like, it, we wouldn't be, you know, if you had two pharmacists and six technicians, you wouldn't be stressed out for a, a five to 600 prescription day. Yeah, and that's assuming no vaccination <laughs> and rapid tests. Yeah, those we are could all do the patient calls. Services. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, when I owned my stores, I never did vaccines and I didn't do any rapid tests. I just thought it was like, look, this is a waste of time. I, I get how it's a really high margin um, service, but it I think a lot of people. Be, it got slashed because I remember each vaccination, it used to be like $46 or something. It got dropped down to like 21. And then I think the recent figure was like eight or nine bucks. Or just the, for the administration or for. Yeah. The administration. Oh, wow. So it that's went from forty six dollars to nine or ten dollars. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Uh, so <laughs> it takes like a it lot of time. If it wasn't worth it at forty bucks, it's definitely not worth it at nine. Yeah, that's crazy. If you told me as a provider, you know, I'm going to give a nine dollar flu shot, uh, yeah. that's a lot of work because realistically, uh, vaccination takes fifteen minutes. So in one hour, you'd be making thirty six dollars. A pharmacist. Pay rates are usually about in the 60s and 70s range. Yeah. It's not practical at all. <laughs> like if you're doing, you know, 50 to 60 immunizations a day, you would need a dedicated pharmacist just for that. And it doesn't add up. You wouldn't be able to afford that pharmacist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen this um, gal, Bled Tenno. I've seen her all over LinkedIn. She has this hashtag, pizza's not working. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really good, I think, what she's doing for the industry. Um, it, it's definitely needed. And what kind of sucks is you have all these pharmacy students. They definitely will feel so upset and disenfranchised when they come out of school and realize, like, what the fuck did I go to pharmacy school for? A lot of people feel that way right now. If you scroll down, it says, you know, at corporations like CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Rite Aid, the huge pharmacies, errors are a cost of doing business. That is... Not how we should view healthcare. I would be very careful to even say that. This guy's the professor and dean emeritus at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. And they're also probably a huge feeder to of students to these places. Oh man. Yeah. It, it's kind of interesting to me. Um, you know, as we've sort of talked and covered about Farmageddon, these pharmacist walkouts. A lot of pharmacists I've asked to come on our podcast to talk about it, they're actually really hesitant to even say anything. And the obvious concern here is like, well, what if I get backlash from my employer seeing this? <laughs> and of course, yes. yeah, you're, you have job concern. Job security is a huge thing. And especially in today's environment where everything is just getting incrementally more expensive and you're getting much more less of everything that you buy. Job security is a huge concern. You can't afford to just simply live. I saw this one funny clip of somebody did like a, a payment plan for their lunch. So they were paying $2 every week to pay off like a $10 meal. And I'm like, this is, if this is what it's come down to, this is insanity. Like to not even be able to feed yourself to get to work or do whatever you have to do. You have to get on a payment plan to pay for an $8 meal. That's rough. Like we are looking at, we're looking down the barrel of a pretty bad, you know, situation. It's a ticking time bomb for sure. Pharmacy is like just one ticking time bomb right now. Again, if the revenue receipts don't go up every year and are adjusted for inflation and pharmacists are not receiving those payment adjustments, their rates are going down. <laughs> if you scroll to the way bottom, cause like the people ask, you know, why isn't the board of pharmacy doing anything to kind of address this concern? And it just says, Oh, one of the CVS, no, you're right there. Keep going back up uh, a little bit more right here. The board should stay focused on the regulation of practice of pharmacy rather than the business of pharmacy. So it's like, we have a regulatory agency that is supposed to kind of monitor and make sure that things are going right, but they're kind of just taking a step back and watching how it all pans out. 
you know, and then on the business side of it, I, I mean, I kind of agree the the board is there to keep the public safe and to make sure that pharmacies are operating properly. Um, they shouldn't be in the business of any business, but I don't know, taking a back seat and watching, watching thousands of pharmacists that are licensed by your governing entity say that, Hey, this isn't right. And then to just sit back and be like, well, that's not our job. It's but kinda... it, I, I think it's the board of pharmacy's job to say something here, because if you have a mass exodus of pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, just walking out of the pharmacy, it becomes a public health issue. Yeah. Who's going to get literally these become a public health issue. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like a huge public health issue. If, if people can't, if, if a, phar- a lot of these pharmacies are closed for three days, if there's life-saving medication that needs to be dispensed within three days and patients can't get it, well, then you're creating a whole nother health, you know, epidemic or whatever you want to call it. It's, and it's just a, it's a snowball effect after that. You know, pharmacies are understaffed. They can't fill these things. Patients are getting worse. They need more medications. Well, the pharmacy's not open. And then, so they need more. It just keeps going on and on and on in a circle. So I find this article, part of the article interesting. Enforcing these rules could prove challenging California, one of the first states to outlaw pharmacy production quotas and mandate minimum staffing, is coping with routine violations by retail pharmacies that then fail to provide to provide records to inspectors seeking to verify complaints. State Board of Pharmacy minutes show. Yeah, I mean, they rather probably just pay the fine. <laughs> and these fines can be probably really de minimis and not, not of much value to, to such a large publicly traded company. Remember, they're vertically integrated. Where's all the value being extracted? It's <laughs> on the PBM side. Yeah. Right before the money gets passed and distributed down to the provider level. It's wild. I think that's why you don't also hear as much from the CVS side that you do with the other two or three big box chains. Yep. Um, CVS kind of took a step back and realized that, hey, the dispensing portion of our business model isn't generating the revenue that it should be. Yep. So they went and integrated you know, the health plan. They got the PPM. They started clinics and just kind of generated other revenue streams to kind of offset the losses that maybe a pharmacy was facing. But that's one chain. And, you know, if the other two, for whatever reason, aren't existent anymore, well, then you have a monopoly issue, right? With the chain pharmacy and that can't be done either. So it's a balancing act and... Right now is pretty off balance. I've given the company thousands and thousands of dollars in free labor, said a CVS pharmacist who was on Hadir's team during the pandemic era conference calls. Our bosses can log into the computer anytime and tell how far behind we are. <laughs> they will send group texts. You're laughing, but I have a story about this. They will send group texts and say, I see you're trending behind. Oh, fuck me. These trending people behind. These people micromanage so hard. What are your plans to finish it tonight? Very intimidating comments. You fear for your job all the time. Let's play this. Do we want to play this? Yeah. Ah, we're going to have to play it. That's two for expanded. I don't know. Like two additional patients. I have no idea. I don't know what that means. It's yeah. I mean, it's really hard to incorporate, you know, sales requirements for a business like onto like a clinical health provider it's just really difficult imagine you're in a hospital and you have these quotas of like all right clinical pharmacist we know we have patients in the icu but we need you to give more vancomycin i know you're probably dosing it you know every 12 or every whatever the range is do it every one hour now so we can build higher like what well see here's here's the issue though it's like on one end, it's a business that needs to generate revenue to operate, but you're also dealing with people's health, which is a priority concern. Like in an ideal world, you would have unlimited time, unlimited resources to really care for the patient in front of you and get the best possible outcome. Well, you don't have adequate time, you don't have adequate resources, and you don't have adequate staff to make sure everything gets done. And you want to still give the best possible care. Well, something's going to have to suffer in that equation. And what's suffering right now? It's the healthcare. It's the care for the patients that are coming to these pharmacies in the first place. 
So the most important metric that we as healthcare providers went to school for, took an oath for, we can't even live up to those standards. Right? Because yeah. you have I think, to. I, I think the other part you have to put in here is you're also in the back of a grocery store. <laughs> Forgot that from the very beginning. You know? <laughs> you want your damn Captain Crunch and your damn Lipitor at the same time, and I want it now. Oh, I ain't trying to wait. What's, you know, it's interesting about this quote. You know, this person, he claims to have worked thousands and thousands of dollars in free labor. I actually know some CVS pharmacists that have to take their work home with them. Really? I know. I, yeah. I, and I know that we have mutual friends that, you know, on a personal basis, like, mm-hmm. yeah, they told me, like, I have to take work home with me. And they're not like managers or district leaders. These are actually employees of the business. They're not gunning to become a manager, but they're just doing this so that the next day it's not as busy for them at work. I don't know if they've had any, I guess, stress behind their leadership. I mean, from this situation with like this Louisiana and H- H- Hadir's um, pharmacies, it's just, man, if he was my boss, I'd probably quit on the fucking spot. I hate it when people micromanage. It's not something, you know, I can do well. I know what needs to get done and I do it. But when you have that constant bickering all the time as it's an the employee voice, the working for someone, it. it's like, dude. I get it. It'll get done, but there's something more urgent and pressing that I'm dealing with at the moment. What do you want me to do? If you scroll a little bit further down, there's like this uh, picture on the right hand side right there. So it says, let's see. Uh, Notes from a Walgreens coaching session says that average handle time for data reviews should be 20 seconds or less. And for clinical reviews, it should be eight seconds or less. Fuck you. Are you kidding me? 20 you seconds have- for data entry and eight seconds to verify it. Like I outlined that, you know, in the most efficient manner, it would be a 90 second thing. And you want all this to be done in 28 seconds. I have now, never, I in my practice, I never implemented anything like this, like an average handle time. No. For me, it's like the work needs to get done. Everything needs to be properly done and with the highest level of care. That's the priority, you know? But to have 28 seconds to fill a single script from start to finish is straight up impossible. I don't care how fast you type. You can be the fastest typer in the world and have like instant recall of whatever, and you still wouldn't be able to do that. It would take you 28 seconds to get the medication from the shelf and put it in the bottle and then cap that bottle. Do you know how much Adderall you would need to hit this metric of like 20 <laughs> seconds of data entry and eight seconds of uh, clinical checking? Like, this is crazy. The, the, whoever wrote this is insane. This is insane. If you look to the right, it's like, I pray every day I don't miss something or cause a patient harm, said the Tennessee-based pharmacist who estimates that she handles 700 prescriptions per day. A That's single a person handling 700 is, is, it shouldn't be, that shouldn't be allowed. This is how errors happen. I've done 800 in a day, but that's cause I used robotics and the robotics actually check all the medications before. So all I had to do was just, um, verify the clinical profile, making sure it's, um, appropriate therapeutics. But yeah, like, I mean, again, these pharmacies don't have these kind of like robotics that I They don't have, even so. have a Kirby machine, like an automatic counter. Yeah. Like okay. That's kind of weird. How, yeah. Which is weird to me. It's like, how come people don't have Kirby Lester's? Like they're really not that expensive. No, it's the, the new, if you want to buy like the most crazy newest model, it's like 10 grand, I think, or 12 grand. That's it? For, for like the basic, you know, the, the basic high end model. And then they have like the additional ones where it does it by weight and all that. Those are like, I think 18 or 19,000. Yeah, no they're not like $50,000 machines. Yeah. That whole design I think was kind of stupid, but oh, a lot of for some reason. Like, okay. So when I remember buying like three or four Kirby, Kirby Lester's back in the day, it was like maybe five grand, six grand. For the, the K, the, the big one. The KL right? one, the, the KL one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still use that one to this day. Yeah, because it's solid, dude. It works dude, it so hasn't well. Broken. Yeah, yeah, it's such a solid machine. Yeah, I saw that there was this. Um, it's called IQ, like the I and then letter Q. Yeah, that's the, the one by weight, or that scans it, right? 
Yeah, so it, it, it uses AI to like count the pills with capsules and it takes a picture. And I think that one was actually, I see a lot of people use it for controlled medications. So the thing with the, the ones that take a picture, they do it by weight. It's you, you pour them all onto the cap, onto the surface and then it weighs it or it takes a picture and then it tells you, okay, there's 67 capsules on here. There should only be 30. So you're sitting there taking out 37 capsules from the thing. I'm like this is kind of not intuitive. Like you'd rather just pour it into a machine and, you know, have it go from zero to 30. Wow. Okay. So this is actually a good article. They actually talk about pharmacy benefit managers playing a role in this current crisis, Farmageddon. I don't agree with this. Independent chain pharmacies like we're earning relatively healthy profits from drug sales and can afford to hire and retain enough staff to keep their operations humming. Okay. A constellation of factors contribute to the industry's downturn. They include rising drug costs. Okay. Changing consumer habits. I don't know if I'd agree with this one. And the emergence of online pharmacies. Don't agree with this online pharmacies portion. Online pharmacy meaning like, like Amazon's like pharmacy? Amazon, or? Cuban? Yeah. I, I, I don't know here, but you know, I think there was like some sort of st uh, percentage that was done. And it's like still like 90% of all uh, medications are filled by a retail provider. Someone you have to go to. Online pharmacies really haven't made a huge dent that most people thought that it was going to make. I don't understand this change in consumer habits because here's the thing. If you need a medication, you need a medication. That's for your life. I don't need to talk to you into buying this. Like, yeah. there's, no, like there's no sales model I'm at where I have to come into. You need to buy this medication. It's like, all right, you know, you have something that's going on with your body and you'd like to have, make sure you don't die anytime soon. You want to extend your life. So right. that I don't really get this changing consumer habits. Well, but then, you want to see a crazier metric? Scroll down right there. In today's world, seven out of 10 medications dispensed by a pharmacy are dispensed at a loss. I agree with that. Yeah. I actually will, would agree with that answer there. But and this article do you says- understand, Do you understand the reason like why it's quote unquote dispensed at a loss is because let's say you have a medication that costs $3,500, right? For, it says for non-generic, so it's, do you use like a specialty medication? A medication that costs $3,500 for meat Let's say I dispense it and the insurance pays me back 3,480 bucks. So I lost $20, right? I'm still paying $3,500 for that medication. I still have to dispense it and take that $20 hit. For bigger contracts and bigger pharmacies like CVS, Walgreens, you know, all these bigger chains, they might be buying that same medication at 3,300 instead of 3,500 because they have better contracts. They have better rates negotiated with manufacturers and their wholesalers. So they can eat up those quote unquote losses. They can absorb but, it. Yeah, they can absorb it and kind of even it out. But for small businesses, you know, they can't do that. Each script counts. Yeah, it does. I, I, it's just so weird. I mean, why is it that we have a system where, you know, you have to absorb the cost of other some drugs and not absorb the cost of other drugs? Like, why, why does this, why does this practice even exist? Does it exist in the clothing industry? Does it exist in, I don't know, the shoe industry? Like, I don't think it does. I mean, I don't know 100% because we're not in that industry. So I can't, I can't say that I know that it doesn't, but I'm pretty sure it's not the same. No one's going to purposely sell a loss unless, you know, they have to move inventory for whatever reason. Right. Well, but in this me, sort of situation. You, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, let me ask you a simple question. If every business was operating at a loss, what would happen? There wouldn't be a business. No shit. <laughs> so obviously every industry is not operating at a loss the way this is highlighted to be. Otherwise there'd be no businesses in the world. Like it's not, it's not rocket science. It's, it's kind of common sense guys. Right. I like how this article even says, but none looms larger than the outsized influence of pharmacy benefit managers. These third party administrator, administrators of health insurers, prescription drug programs have eroded the profits of retail pharmacies to the point where now where they lose money on many sales. Which is you true. Know, they even say that they negotiate drug prices, manufacturers determine which drugs will be covered and set the reimbursement rates for pharmacies. As the power of PBM rose over the years, they demanded bigger rebates from drug manufacturers and pocketed increasingly bigger shares of those savings and passing them along. They also lowered pharmacy reimbursement rates and tax on hefty fees known as direct and indirect remuneration. This is actually very well written now. 
So mm -hmm. this article, I wish it had talked about sooner than later, but this is a huge part of it. These direct and indirect renew, uh, remunerations are like so ridiculous. Like they're so crazy to me. Like the insurance company will come back one year from now and say, hey, look, we just thought we paid you too much. Um, we know this drug cost $900 and we gave you like a thousand. We're going to take like 1,500 back. <laughs> no, it's not. Even, you think that's crazy. It's okay. This drug costs a thousand. You dispensed it. We paid you 900. So you already took the hundred dollar hit, but then we still think we paid you too much. Actually it should have been 700. So let me take $200 more out. So you dispensed it at a loss and they're going to take $200 more because you still think you paid too much. In what world does that make any sense? Yeah, can you imagine if you go buy a car from Tesla and then they lowered their prices and you're like, hey, I want to go back. You know, I'm not really happy. Can I claw back my money? No, Tesla would just say, go fuck yourself and you can buy a new model that's coming out next year. Yeah. That would never happen. That would never happen. It's it's not standard business practice. Like, it, this isn't how businesses operate. Uh, Express Scripts owned by Cigna, CVS Camera owned by CVS Health, and Optin RX owned by United Healthcare, control majority of the market. Actually, United Healthcare, I think controls collectively the largest portion of healthcare. It's larger than care market. I, uh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about all healthcare. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no if it's pharmacy, I believe it's care market is like, care mark. they're, they're number it's one for sure. With the biggest market share. Yeah. Oh, this looks like another uh -oh. juicy. I'm going to hit play. It's the same guy. It's the same guy. Dude. I thought, I thought our job as a pharmacist. We don't our get job paid to educate. Pharmacist. Yeah, we don't what? get paid to educate. You get yeah, paid we to can't build for our. We we can't bill for our uh, educational hours. I want to become a fucking professor <laughs> if, I, if I was going to teach. I wonder where this guy is today. I would I would can this guy so fast. He's just bad PR. If I had to rely on filling only prescriptions, I would be out of business. Pharmacist and independent owner of Grove Park Pharmacy in South Carolina. I don't get this. Why she she's wearing a Remington drug company, which I assume is like some sort of independent pharmacy. Why is she posing in front of CVS? Uh, it says pharmacy Wendy Lear said that she felt pressured to work alone in dangerous situations at CVS. She quit in 2021. So she left the chain to. to good go for to her. Home. Honestly, really good for her. Oh, this text, this text message is juicy. I got someone ringing my doorbell. So give me a second. So we'll read this text out. It says, any word, I can't stay here. I am so sick. I'm going to have to close and can't get it out. Can't get out of the bathroom. My husband is coming to pick me up. If you can find someone to come back in before eight o'clock, that'd be great. I spoke with Kim and she said that she can't get here tonight, but she's the only one. She could work all day tomorrow if needed. Okay, please ask her to go ahead and plan on covering tomorrow. I am working on getting someone there. Please have SM take care of patients. Salma, I can't have the pharmacy open. If a pharmacist isn't at the pharmacy, I have to shut the gates. Okay, please secure RX with alarm. This pharmacist pretty much said, you know, I can't be here. Or the, yeah. That's really sad. And this is the, the sad reality. It's like, you know, a lot of these pharmacies are working with a single pharmacist there. If the pharmacist isn't there, the pharmacy can't legally be open. Well, if you don't have anyone else to cover, what are your options? You have to shut your doors. If you shut your doors for a full day, that's a full day's worth of revenue that you're kind of missing out on. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm... I'm... I'm laughing because I've heard of some incidents where some people have asked the pharmacist to leave the store open when they go on their lunch break and there's no pharmacist there, but legally they're not allowed to do that. And that dialogue usually comes from the manager of the front end of the store. It's right. weird. There's <laughs> not a licensed anything. And technically, if you ask me, and here's another thing with that model, a lot of times in these um, grocery stores or, you know, chain pharmacy environments, the pharmacy, the pharmacist, the entire pharmacy team is at a bracket lower than the general store manager who's not licensed and doesn't know any of the laws or entities that, you know, or laws or regulations that need to be in place. So someone who's, I don't want to say less qualified, but someone who isn't, doesn't fit the role of regulating these things is telling licensed professionals what to do even if it's breaking the law or going against regulation like that, 
in no world is that okay, right? Yeah. Jesus, this is a very long, long well, yeah, this is a good, I I might actually email Emily here and say, wow, that's a fantastic article. Thank you. So it's public safety, basic decency. Shouldn't have to cry at work or go home worried that they made a mistake. Could you imagine every day you go home and you're like, wow, I filled 600 prescriptions today. I hope all 600 were correct. And I didn't put the wrong pills in the bottle. I'm just just class action lawsuit have that looming every single day. Well, I, I am glad that there is more light being shed up on this entire issue, um, because it's more than just an issue. It's, it, it needs to be overhauled. And I know it'll take a lot of time to do it. Um, and a lot of reiterations. Um, but it needs to be done. Because it's going to get to a point where the healthcare condition is just declining and nobody wants to do anything about it. And, you know, we're, we're, we're a society where we kind of rely on medications for a lot of things, especially with health concerns that can't be fixed without medications and to not be able to get those, um, it kind of just puts a huge blunder in the entire healthcare environment. (laughs) It's me. bad. It's really bad. Yeah. For sure. uh, bad is bad was like five years ago. This is we're past bad. You know, bad. bad. You know what bad was? Bad was when we knew what reality was, but we were biting the bullet and just going with it. That's when it was bad. This is past that. We're we're way past that moment now. Like this is like things need to change asap, or there's going to be a huge issue. And the, if if the entire country's health is declining. It's a multifaceted issue that needs to be addressed by so many different organizations and agencies. Yeah. That's all I have to say. And yeah, I mean, would you, would you consider going back to retail pharmacy? If it's not independent? No. Yeah. I I mean, I never, I only interned and did my externships and all that at CVS and all these chains, but I had no intention. If, If I had to go work at CVS or Walgreens or any big box chain, I would turn in my license. Peace out <laughs> or just keep it inactive. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to have that, that looming like concern every single day, you know? And if for, let's say it's like you, you're there for two, three years, picture this. Some people have been doing this for 30, 40 years in that same environment, nine hours a day for 30 years with this constant looming concern. Like if that doesn't take a toll on you, I don't know what does. But that that is some resilient person if if that hasn't affected them at all. Yeah, I, I I'm never going back. <laughs> I can tell yeah. you that. I don't I don't want to do it. I mean, I don't mind doing independent pharmacy, but see, independent's yeah. fun. You know, like I enjoy it because it's I get to operate. You know, the way I want workflow gets to be the way I want. Very streamlined, like designations, all everything that we talked about that needs to be there in a pharmacy practice setting. I've like tried to implement. So I enjoyed that. Like it was actually a lot of fun for me. It still is a lot of fun for me, but would I give all that up and go to like a retail, traditional retail setting? Hell no, never. No. Jeez. But to end on that note, we will continue to update you guys as uh, more of these walkouts are scheduled. And hopefully as we see some more change, because I think, Talking about it is great and bringing awareness to it is also really great, but action needs to be taken. So I'm hoping that action is taken over the course of however long and we can continue updating our audience uh, with this too. Because I don't want to have everyone think that pharmacy is a a doom and gloom, you know, industry. doom and gloom industry. (laughs) Yeah, but it's also, it's it's a requirement, you know, It's, it's a doom and gloom industry that needs to be there. So, oh my God. you know, it's like that one cousin that you have to have at all your parties because it, you know, you're going to get annoyed and it's, you're never going to hear the end of it for the entire rest of the year. It's like, it's an industry that kind of has to be there. You can't get away from it, but hopefully it improves. So, all right. Till the next time, note, I guess. Till next time. See you guys all. See all y'all see next you week. See you on the next, uh, next week. Later. Take care.